Cool. All right. Well, um, I'm, we're recording now, so um, I'm going to start confusingly at the end. Um, okay. Can you tell us what you want the Aurelia Institute, what your ultimate aim is? What's, your, what's the goal that would make you happiest to achieve in the work that you're doing? Absolutely. The long-term goal of Aurelia Institute is to scale fundamentally humanity's presence in particularly low Earth orbit around our Earth, but also in the near neighborhood of our solar system. And that means, can we build architecture that is worthy of science fiction, space habitats that can actually house thousands of people, maybe eventually space cities floating in microgravity perhaps spun by the power of light alone. That would be a worthy goal, I think, looking out into the 50, 100-year time frame for Aurelia. I just love it. I love it already. Thank you. Because <laughs> um, this, this is science fiction turning real. So let's start with how... Let, let's get to that point. Let's see how close we are to that stage. Um, what, are, what is our current presence in low Earth orbit and how would you envisage expanding it? So this is such an important thing to call out because I think a lot of people think, oh, that's such a long-term dream, science fiction, living life in orbit. It's happening. It's happening in the next four years. There is a burgeoning commercial ecosystem led by Axiom, a commercial space habitat company, other companies like Blue Origin, Orbital Reef, NanoRacks, um, you know, Lockheed, Northrop, many different players in the international and particularly U.S. and British space scene working together to put commercial space stations in low Earth orbit. So pretty soon it will no longer just be International Space Station, the international government space station and Tiangong, the Chinese space station, which is also already up there, but it will actually be commercial real estate in orbit. We'll have business parks where Hollywood can film movies and scientists can do science and space tourists can go and experience the overview effect. And you're saying that this is, one, this ecosystem already exists, and two, the possibility of having these commercial... Um, habitable low Earth orbit stations will happen in the next four or five years? Yes. So we'll see a longer time frame to actually build out a lot of habitable modules in space. But in terms of Axiom's plans, Orbital Reef's plans, yes, within the next four years, we're about to see a really intense growth of privately operated modules first attached to the International Space Station, kind of growing off of that platform. And then eventually, as the International Space Station is um, retired, which is the current plan by NASA, these modern modules will actually take over and become the new commercial platforms in orbit. I've just got so many questions. Um, let, let's start, <laughs> As you yeah, thank you. Let's start with the uh, intensely pragmatic about how on earth you get, I mean, how big are the rockets going to have to be mm. to get the bits of equipment on that attach to the International Space Station? But you have a plan, Ariel. I have a plan. Yes, you, you led into this very nicely for me. Thank you. So right now, rockets are able to contain a small module, like the size of what is building up to the International Space Station. And this is also the approach that Axiom and Orbital Reef are taking, is to use current rockets and their you know, the modules that you live in are constrained by your biggest rocket payload fairing. But the idea to actually scale beyond that, getting closer to that Aurelia dream, the next generation of space architecture, not the ones that are being planned initially for commercial, but beyond that, is to say, can we use robotics to self-assemble structures in space that are way bigger than our biggest rocket payload fairing? The idea here is take Legos to space. And once the Legos are in space, maybe with some fancy magnets and some good control code to make them work well, then let them build this infrastructure that could be worthy of a space cathedral or a microgravity concert hall or a space hotel. And have you, you've been working up the potential options for what that would look like? So in, in your mind's eye and with the, you know, the constraints of of physics and money. Um, <laughs> yes. What does that look like right now? Sometimes the constraints of money are harder than the constraints of physics. Oh, right. okay. yeah. right. <laughs> yes. So what that looks like right now, there's a project that we're working on that was my PhD at MIT. It is now the core project of Aurelia Institute, and this is called Tesserae. So tiles that are pentagons and hexagons 
they can pack flat in a rocket, kind of like Ikea furniture. And then once that rocket gets out to space, we open the rocket and there's a, essentially a glorified Pez dispenser that spits these tiles out one at a time. The tiles float autonomously. So there's no astronaut out there controlling them. There's no robotic arm telling them where to go. They have powerful magnets on their edges that make them want to draw together and dock. And the idea is initially to form a buckyball out of those tiles. Now, buckyball uh, is a glorified soccer ball. No, we did not just come up with this for the FIFA World Cup. This has been actually in the works for quite a long time. And we have had the pleasure of already testing out miniature scale tesserae tiles with the magnets, with the code, with the physical, you know, mechanical engineering to make it all work and the electronics on two international space station missions. So this is an example where every platform that's out there becomes the birth of the next platform. So we've been able to use ISS National Lab. Uh, we've worked with NanoRacks, which is a commercial provider. And most recently, we worked with Axiom on the historic X1 mission to actually test out the prototype engineering for this larger scale grand dream of doing Tesserae at Habitat scale. Can I ask you, I mean, again, can I just ask you how that feels for you, having gone from that written on, you know, as a PhD thesis to literally being tested <laughs> in space? It feels stunning. It feels absolutely stunning. I still remember to this day, it was March of 2020, right as the pandemic was hitting in the US, and my tiles had been shipped up to space for the first time. It was like Dorothy, um, the Wizard of Oz, I'm not in Kansas anymore, <laughs> but to look up in the sky and we watch the ISS go over, because you can sometimes, in certain geographies, you can see it. It's a very bright satellite in the sky. And it was just unbelievable to think that my research was up there actually trying to work on the future of life in space for humans. It was really um, a moment of a lot of humility and a lot of gratitude as well, because it takes a lot of different people and a lot of collaboration to make that happen. Dumb question. If, if you're able to expand the, the self-assembling um, habit, habitable area, will it, have, mm -hmm. will it have zero gravity or microgravity? Will it have some gravity? Mm -hmm. What would it have? Ooh, fantastic question. The answer is it could be answer E, all of the above. And the idea here is initially it will be floating because that'll be the first test. Test array habitats are reconfigurable. And so we want them to be able to be in a floating environment in orbit around you know, a planet or a moon and be able to pop the tiles off when they're damaged and you don't need them anymore, pop them back on, reconfigure it. Maybe you had a window yesterday where today you need a docking port because you want to have a conference in space and all your friends are coming. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the initial microgravity vision. But long-term, we already know from astronauts like Scott Kelly, the twin that spent a year in space, we humans cannot live successfully, healthfully um, for a long period in microgravity. A lot of weird things happen to our body. And so we need to spin habitats in the future. If you spin them, you get some triple force, you essentially get artificial gravity. And if you spin them, then in certain areas of the habitat, you can get close to earth gravity if it's big enough or if you're spinning it fast enough. And so that is the plan for the future to design ring habitats or even a spherical habitat, a buckyball like tesserae that can spin and actually give that gravity environment that's needed for long duration space health. Be and just explain a bit more about the effects on the body of such a long yeah. time in space. Yes. So this is the challenge. Where did we evolve? We evolved on the surface of Earth. We're so well tuned to, you know, to the parameters of living life on Earth. When we go out into space, all kinds of things change. One, your heart gets a little weaker because it's not having to pump against gravity. Your bones get weaker because you're not having to walk against the, you know, the force of gravity pulling down on you. Other kind of odd things happen, like your eyeballs become a little bit more spherical. And so the lens changes and your eyesight changes. There's this whole host of things that are also interconnected. And so that's why we really need for deep space missions, long duration flights out to Mars, for example, we will do better as a species if we can have artificial gravity and actually be spinning. Um, the, the, the possibility of scaling this up then to mean hundreds, maybe thousands of people yeah. living in space permanently or working in space or whatever it might be. Okay. Um, what, mm -hmm. do you, what do you see as the primary aim of, of going mm -hmm. up and living in space? What, what, what for? Sure. I usually answer this in a couple ways. I think 
there's a, um, there's a philosophical, almost spiritual answer first, which is that this is something that's meaningful for humanity to do. Exploring space brings new knowledge back to Earth. For example, we only know about certain aspects of climate change and greenhouse gases because we sent probes to Venus. And so there's so much knowledge to be gained about our own life and preserving life on Earth by going out into space and learning more. And I think that that is a really important principle to keep in mind, at least at Aurelia Institute. We are not doing space to abandon Earth. Earth is the best home humanity will ever have. We should be using space technologies to benefit life on Earth. And that's the, even as we, some of us may explore further beyond. And that brings me to my second point, why do we do this? There's a wonderful history of technologies developed for the rigors of life in space, very, very hard environment to engineer properly for, coming back down to benefit everyday citizens on Earth. So things like Kevlar, microwaves, LASIK eye surgery, these things that many of us depend on in everyday life. And at least in the United States, the Apollo program in a profound way gave birth to STEM education at scale, explaining why it's important to consider science and math in your life, um, kind of no matter what career you're going to have. And so that is also a reason why we go to space, because there will be so many different component inventions and technologies that we learn about that can come back and actually improve your day-to-day -day life here on Earth. So how long do you think then before I could look up at the night sky from my mm. back garden and see the, the buckyball floating ah. in space? Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you a little sneak peek. Some of this we can't announce yet, but within this decade, we are working on the first human scale in space deployment. Next year, we're actually going to unveil, and maybe this would be fun to do this for your audience and invite some people to come along. We're going to unveil the first human scale terrestrial mock-up. So you can actually walk inside the full scale buckyball and experience not just what the structure is going to be like, but we're really thinking thoughtfully about what is the interior design? Mm -hmm. What do people want to experience? How do you people live a life worth living in space that's not just a science lab? So next year for the Earth-based mock-up, within this decade uh, for a test of a properly self-assembling autonomous build at human scale in space. And then by the 2030s, the hope is to actually be operating these and have more than one. So you can actually begin to get that dream of scaling the available volume in space where people can live and work and play. And presumably there's a, there's a sort of organic growth of the, the, the tesserae mm -hmm. uh, buckyball that if, you know, you need extra bits, the, the, the new bit of flat pack can be yeah. sent up and it can be augmented in that way as well. So it can grow, sort of evolve, almost literally evolve. Exactly. So this was so core to my PhD inspiration was to look at nature. How does nature grow? It grows organically and fits and starts when it gets the energy or the water to grow more. And so that's exactly what we wanted to do with Tesserae was build on this notion of self assembly from biology and organic growth, where you can expand maybe not infinitely, but nearly indefinitely on this shared platform to give you that flexibility for life in orbit and to welcome more people to a life in space. And do you imagine that inside the the spin, the spinning, you know, near Earth gravity buckyball, uh, that, that water would be able to be produced inside it or food would be able to be produced inside it rather than having to shuttle back and forth to boring old Earth? Yes, to delightful older. Delightful but yes. Older. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, so we're looking at technologies like bio regenerative life support uh, to be able to do a, essentially a closed loop ecosystem inside of that habitat. How can we certainly, you know, scrub our own air? You have to take the CO2 that humans breathe out and turn it back into oxygen. And then there's also a role for plant matter being able to produce new oxygen for a space habitat and then also being able to provide some of the mental health and well-being and the biophilia that many of us humans get by being out in nature. So there are many different aspects of, yes, producing water um, through chemical processes or sourcing water from other places in the solar system. The moon is of high interest right now as a place that might become a depot, like a gateway for further exploration in the solar system because we can get water from the moon instead of having to go back to Earth, for example. And who do you envisage being the sort of the pioneers of this, the type of people mm -hmm. going up there? So this is something that I think will and should be different than what pioneers used to look like before. I think we used to have this mentality of massive grit and the requirement for pioneers to be a very certain type of person. The goal for space 
is to democratize access now. The goal for space is to open it to artists and designers and architects, to open it to families that are not high net worth families that they can actually think about if you can take a trip on a plane for a vacation, we're trying to make it possible within the next few years for you to take a trip to space. I think the mission now for the space industry has to show people that this is a life where they can see themselves living, even if they live on Earth and they do it more as a, a journey for a little bit of a, you know, a trip for a holiday. This is something that we're now really, really focused on, which is opening access to life in space. So you don't need a PhD in physics. You don't need to be no. in necessarily peak physical condition to, no. to go to space. Exactly. And many different groups are actually already proving this. So there's a wonderful group called Astro Access in the United States that is bringing uh, different types of variously abled and disabled people to fly in zero gravity and bring them into the future of space exploration. Um, we are already seeing groups like Inspiration4 uh, with SpaceX and the Axiom flights bring private citizens to space that by no means would necessarily pass the traditional, you know, ESA, European Space Agency and NASA requirements for being the top zero, 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 whatever percent of human talent. So yes, we are already, we're already breaking through those boundaries in a really big way. Have you been to space? I have not myself, but I would love an opportunity to How go. How close I've have you telling... been? Ah, so I have been on nine parabolic flights. Uh, so in the hundreds of zero-G parabolas that I've flown now, this is how we train astronauts. Uh, this is also how we test out early examples of our engineering and our science. Wow, so you've and, been in zero gravity? Yes, I've been in zero gravity. I have floated weightless, and it is the most sublime and joyful experience you can imagine. I actually, this is one of the mission on our educational side for Orvelli Institute is we offer zero G flights where we bring people outside of the MIT ecosystem. You don't need to be an MIT graduate student to go with us. So yes, you should try it out yourself. Oh my God, please. Can I go on one of these <laughs> flights? I mean, I honestly, I honestly cannot imagine what it must feel like. I've got, I, I kind of think it must feel like being underwater, but, but even better. But even better, that's the thing. So that is the nearest analog that you can think of. That's the nearest comparison. But there's no drag. You're not having to push against anything. And in fact, when the you know when the students first experience it and you're floating in zero G for the first time, a lot of people try to swim because that's the human instinct. But you end up flailing, and it's actually much better to be very zen. And literally, all you need to do to fly across the entire length of the airplane cabin is just push off with the fingertip. It's unbelievable. You're a genius. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> it's been a, a great pleasure to talk to you and hopefully we can speak again at some stage in the future. Thank you so much. I would be delighted. Thank you so much for having me on your show. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for your time.